Right. I'm calling my talk from the public outcry to the private cry. Um, and that's the slide of the Million Women Rise March that you'll all be familiar with. Um, now, the idea for this conference came up, as Helen said, between a chance email connection with Dr. Tracy. Um, I realized that he was part of a national narrative. And then we both realized that the Women's Service in Oxford has been devoted to this national narrative for nearly 20 years. So I'm going to today describe a fragment of the work of the Women's Service. Um, from the public outcry to the private individual detail of work within women's service with individual women, all of whom are in secondary mental health services, all of whom have uh, reported sexual, childhood sexual abuse, and all of whom have been diagnosed with a severe and enduring mental illness. Um, I called it from the public to the private because in my view, the sort of everyday sexism and inequality that you will all know about in the workplace or in relationships also structure and move within a spectrum towards the sexual abuse of children. Um, some of you might find that a bit of a stretch. Sarah Campion, Labour MP for Rotherham, a town still struggling with the impact of the abuse of children after seven years, says, if a new technology, drug, or junk food were doing such damage, it would be classed as a public health emergency. It is striking, then, that the toxic legacy of child abuse gets less attention than theories about whether social media makes teenagers anxious or skinny models fuel anorexia. She says, this is the most public secret we have. I think people recognize and understand it, they are just not prepared to confront it. So today, I'm going to refer briefly to the current context. I'm going to describe the design of the woman's service, which I and I'm going to hope to illustrate the legacy of sexual abuse with a very brief clinical vignette and outline at the end a few key messages. Now, a quarter of a century ago, Ellen Bass, she's, she's the one who wrote Courage to Heal, opened a conference with the words, the world has split open, women have broken the silence. And in a call to arms, she urged for an end to the silencing of survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Around the same time, Tracy Chapman, and I'm hoping we're going to be able to get up a video here, Tracy Chapman was commissioned to sing about the abuse of women in 1988, at Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday. Is it an optimistic thought that we may be living within another such historical moment? Are the silent voices of abused women and children breaking through the denials in public consciousness? We have no shortage of evidence. I'm going to assume you're going to be aware. I'm not going to put up uh, the details you can easily get on Google. According to the Office of National Statistics, 7% of children experience sexual abuse. Girls are four times as likely as boys. Recent evidence from the Truth Project from the International Inquiry has 85% suffering from mental health problems in later life. 50% struggle with education or getting a job. Four out of ten with relational difficulties, sexual difficulties. Some avoid sex altogether. Others uh, engage in the parallel uh, of having multiple sexual partners. One in five have tried to kill themselves. And globally, thinking about globally, victims become numbered in millions from massive communal atrocities, trafficking, the enslavement of women and children who are repeatedly tortured and shamed with overt death threats suggests that the risks may be increasing. So the sexual abuse of children appears to be a, primus, a primal crime, which is unstoppable. But all of us here, and those of us, all of whom here are working within mental health service, and who listen to the narratives of women, will be familiar with the 
is the sequelae of sexual grooming. There is emotional disconnection, dissociation, struggles with intimacy marked by sexual, emotional withdrawal, and either a frozen isolation develops, or conversely, its promiscuous parallels evolve. Self-harm, flashbacks, sleep, eating disorders, somatic symptoms, and always, always, there are problems with trust. Because being sexually abused shatters basic security. It locks the body into hypervigilance. It can revoke later symptoms of hearing voices or disturbances in a sense of self. Such symptoms represent desperate attempts to cope and to survive. But paradoxically, they also keep others at a distance. Um, I'm going to say briefly how we, we were born. It was in the year 2000, just at the turn of the century, the Department of Health had issued a policy and advice guideline document, and Oxleys had won a very small award to develop a pilot project within Oxleys. Two years, two years, very tiny budget. Um, it soon became, I was flooded with referrals. It soon became quite clear that there was a substantial unmet need and Oxleys, after, the, after auditing and evaluating over two years, Oxleys took into the substantial, substantive services the woman's service, which now operates within such, uh, secondary services. Now, you, you can read the key messages, you can read it, obviously it's still there. I have no reason to assume it's not active, but I think Oxleys were the only trust, NHS trust, to take on that, that challenge. So Oxleys were a brave trust because we have ever since been flooded with, with, uh, with need. The last final message, I just want to emphasize, that therapeutic principles must be based on empowerment, partnership, and giving women a sense of control over the pace and movement of therapeutic process. Right, this is a map um, of our service design. Very early on, I took the whole team and we met with Judith Herman, who wrote the classic Trauma and Recovery. And much of our paradigms, which have guided our practice, are based on her, actually her clinic in New York. But basically, each patient is offered assessment and regular reviews throughout the program of psychotherapy. Um, we operate on the basis that we understand there are phased models of care, that, um, progress occurs in stages that a woman may leave and go for many years but then something, something happens and then she may return. Or there may be stages of recovery within the service itself. So we have the um, entry is an assessment, every woman is offered an assessment. And here we have the, you see this decreasing triangle, that's our support service. Um, at the beginning, while a woman might be waiting for therapy, the CPT-based support kicks in. There might be signposting to um, benefits agencies, housing, child binding issues. Um, Maybe a, a full 10-week psychoeducation program offered, or else individual consultation. Uh, Jane Unchamuth is here with us today. She has uh, sadly left our service, but she initiated the 10-week psychoeducation program, which was so popular. And then what that means is that, the, if you see here, that the, the need for support is much less as the psychotherapy options deepen the experience of the woman in the service and is hardly used at all <coughs> uh, uh, once an active psychotherapy program gets going. So we use three different uh, modalities. Um, actually, we've had many more than three as fellow travellers have come along and joined us and offered workshops. We've had body movement, we've had um, couple, for, for many years we had a couple service. But at the moment, and basically, we have an individual integrative psychotherapy with arts program. And arts are very significant. They offer a very direct impact. Uh, they, engage the, the implicit body memory, they act as a transitional form of relating, they revive 
experiences which are termed alexithymic, in other words, experiences for which there are no words, which is very common when someone first comes into the service. Uh, and some patients we've had have been almost completely mute. <coughs> um, then individual psychodynamic psychotherapy and group psychodynamic psychotherapy, and that, that modality privileges the therapeutic relationship, it works with history, with memories, it invites telling and retelling. Um, and it offers a real challenge to a woman who may have lived most of her life outside the field of empathy or understanding. So, uh, um, so reviews are offered periodically, and then at, a, at an appropriate stage, which may be one year, maybe three, um, they are discharged when clinically appropriate, and they are offered the opportunity to move to a moving on group. Now, the moving on, early on, um, the, the initial budget is, was a lot, a lot different to the one we have at the moment, and part of it contained a, a, contribution, a contribution from a partner agency, which was mined, who were able to offer a facilitated self-help group. Uh, after a few years, their budget got cut, and uh, so that's the, the women themselves refused to allow the, uh, the moving on group to die. And they continue, some of them continue to meet uh, uh, and, and to offer that, that invitation to women discharged. Now I've gone ahead of myself, I think, here. Um, as we began to build the service, we invited, as, as Helen said, we invited interested colleagues to join us. So we had a very small budget, but we were rich in human resources as fellow travellers wanted to come on board and work with us, women and some men, who wanted to uh, join with us as we developed a teaching and learning research department, which offered clinical supervision, training supervision, and CPD seminars. So up to date, we've, been, we've had partnership agreements with 30 different universities and training institutions. In 18 years, we have hosted 136 honorary some of them trainees, many qualify and stay on longer to work with us. Um, I won't have time to go into Dr. Rhea Williams, who's also here today, research, but she completed her training and then stayed on and then conducted her PhD research, which is we're waiting for publication based on some of the work with the Women's Service. She, I'm sure she'd be delighted to talk about it if, if, if we get a chance in a break. Um, and, some of the details. Yes, Rhea's here. Oh, Rhea's here. Um, and we, we also had the benefit of a quip with, uh, conducted by Dr. Monica Barzak. I don't know if she's here, but she, she also helped uh, identify and affirm the need for a multimodal um, uh, treatment service. No one size fits all. Um, and so over 18 years, we've offered therapeutic programs to over 600 women, 600 women in only two evening clinics. And we have treated on average 60 patients a week. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think this is the next part. Sorry. Which one's that? Oh, yeah, next one, too. Sorry. Yeah. This, um, this, Drawing in inks, actually, was done by a therapist who worked with us for a while. She actually came over to work with us from Brussels, every week came over from Brussels. Um, and she, here she has drawn in inks um, after a treatment session with a patient. What I think she, she called it uh, Remain Open. And uh, I think she was struggling with the idea that um, with, with the well, the emotional struggle to remain open to the patient's communications. So you can see what she's drawn is a kind of holding environment, which is the clinic. Um, and there's a kind of conjoined circle, uh, which offers protected space. And right at the center of that circle is the patient therapist couple, which she has represented as, uh, the patient she's represented as a, a sort of, 
sort of a little bird in a way, with a sort of stork-like mouth. Um, she's emphasized to herself, and this is something she drew for herself, but I have contacted her and have her permission to use this image, is her struggle to remain open to that little beak-like, stork-like um, communication from the patient. So protected space is our watchword. Uh, we have protected space for teaching, for supervision. The, all the supervision is conducted by experienced <coughs> senior colleagues because that is what it takes to do this kind of work. Thank you. Now, this is a quote from Davis and Frawley who wrote the, a, a classic text called Treating the Adult Survivor of Childhood Sexual Abuse. Every day the survivor is reliving a cast of characters. The therapist has to belong to the abusive scenario, and not just be an observer or a bystanding witness. So what does, what does that mean? <clears throat> the sexual abuse of a child begins with another. It's not the qualities of that individual child, it's social practice. Um, it then becomes an internal disposition of the abused child, who is usually not believed, and who can then spend a whole life searching for a witness. Because without a witness, one is neither credible to oneself nor to another. So as clinicians, we become the witnesses. Some women use their bodies to sig signal undeniable distress. For example, self-harm is a form of communication. It bypasses language. It's visceral. It offers a forced insertion into the witness. Estelle Weldon, who wrote Playing with Dynamite, Says, refers to self harm as keeping hurt alive. It persuades onlookers of an unspeakable event. It offers an unspoken narrative of unspeakable violation. And as Judith Herman reminded us early on, all the perpetrator requires is that we do nothing. But by contrast, the survivor requires others to share the burden of pain. And as memories and associations surface or disappear, therapists and patients alike are left with questions. Did this really happen? Or did I make it up? Did I imagine it? So the risk for the patient is within the conflict. Does the patient, does the woman patient retreat, surrender to invisibility? become invisible again? Or does she try to convince somebody else that something real and terrible has happened? Parallel risks are there for clinicians as well. We may be discredited. We may not be believed. Uh, our testimony may be made irrelevant. As we make available our own psychic potential to become invaded by what is actually horrible, we move through states of confusion, disgust, and disbelief. And that all is experienced as intensely personal. So I'm going to give a clinical vignette, a small clinical vignette, from, a psych from, a, from the part of a treatment that was actually a psychodynamic therapy, which il I hope will illustrate how a traumatic event becomes recovered within a psychotherapy relationship and how it made it possible for the psych how the patient made it possible for the psychotherapist to know how she was trying to control an overwhelming horror. I'm going to call her Anna. When Anna was six, her mother became ill and uh, had to go into hospital many times. And she was cared for by her stepfather, who also repeatedly raped her until she re reached puberty. And when she reached puberty, she tried to disguise the signs of puberty. She realized that he wouldn't want her anymore. And uh, that is, when she came to her assessment with me, she told me of a dream that she was, the night before the assessment, going through a house, desperately searching for something, but she didn't know what it was. Now, when she was 13, she developed seizures during which her eyes appeared to roll back into the back of her head. And that went on for some minutes. And these seizures became a bit of a spectacle. And all onlookers were shocked and scared. 
Then, as she began to enter, on, as well as that, on top of that, entering puberty, she became terrified on another level of her own body changes because she had an attachment to this man who had also abused her. Her mother was in hospital. She needed him. And she began to believe that she was cursed. The seizures were bringing shame on her family. She was diagnosed as epileptic, treated with sodium valproate for some years before when she got into her 20s, Scans revealed that it wasn't epilepsy. These were psychogenic seizures, and she um, was weaned off the sodium valproate, and antidepressant medication was used, and subsequently she was then referred to our service. Um, she was living on state benefits, and the possibility of having a seizure actually directly validated her uh, what was then called disability living allowance. She began her therapy telling her therapist how she had been her stepfather's favorite. And it was some while before she could get into the subject of the abuse. Then she would describe to her therapist, who she had learned to trust, what would happen. Um, when she was being raped, she would close her eyes and she would concentrate on the, se the, the reflex of res her own body-based sexual response. It was a kind of a, a, a responsiveness and she would try to stay within the experience, try to stay real within the experience. But with her eyes closed, because she was literally blinding herself to the horror of watching her stepfather's face turn from what she called from tender to twisted. She did feel used, but she felt she needed him. She developed a very strong alliance with her therapist and, and within the clinic as well. She was uh, a good patient. Like. She was compliant, and she and her therapist also felt they shared a, a kinship, and she felt entranced by this patient. Um, she told her therapist stories which would somehow align them together, because although psychodynamic psychotherapists don't disclose personal details, she, she, it was clear that they were feeling close. And one of the stories she told was how she loved to go to a mainline London station, sit in a bar, and um, watch pa passers by. Just as dusk falls, she, London lights up, and she watched travellers come and go. And this was a story that was charming, a charming story. But let, as the therapy progressed, the pieces come together. The pieces come together, and it was clear that Anna was sex working in this safe place. A sort of soft dehumanization had taken place within the therapist. She so wanted to believe they lived in a shared world. Uh, now, with hindsight, we can that, and with lots of supervision and looking back, it was quite clear that Anna was cueing her therapist that here is a traumatic context. Um, but as twilight and dissociation make familiar shapes unrecognizable, so the image of a timeless scenario was sustained within the therapist's conscious state. So she had to challenge her. And when she challenged her, she said that she had begun to fear that the honesty between them was evaporating. At which point Anna immediately flew out of the session and in shame and humiliation. She missed several sessions, but then did manage to return to tell her therapist, you have devastated me. And she said, when I see what this is all about, it collapses like dominoes inside me. She was struggling to maintain her, she needed the therapist, just as she needed her stepfather. But then when the therapist said, offered her a challenge, she immediately associated that challenge with the possibility that the person she needed could turn from a, a nurturing stepfather therapist into a narcissistic abusive one. So, the seizures then became revived. They were florid expressions of shame and hate and revenge. Just as when she was 13, these seizures had shocked her entire family. <coughs> And now it was her therapist who was being punished. Anna's intensely felt need, being punished for Anna's intensely felt need. 
Now this is a very complex scenario, very complex trellis routes. And, and, and these to, uh, evokes the dissociated qualities of both therapist and patient, as it always does. There's two or more stepfathers, and there's two or more stepdaughters, at least as many as that. One stepfather is the one who encourages her, feeds her, notices her, and gives her respite. Then suddenly, he arrives monstrous, transgressive. He crushes and silences her. Now, the earlier stepfather may have been symbolized, but the later abusive one never was. So within the therapy, she and her therapist are caught up with the way she finds derivatives one in the other. It's very complex. And she wants to grow beyond this. But when she detects something in her therapist that can change, she gets hurled into the prism of traumatic memory, where time stands still. It's, it's, uh, not a, uh, we've, we've, we've learned that there are different types of memory, and in this sort of episodic memory, uh, t there is a point where time stands still, and this is the content of flashbacks which remain um, unelaborated, <coughs> unable to be incorporated into a narrative. So in these in these fixed states, she um, she had become blinded, with the, and, 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 and there were the seizures. And then we understood it that there was we understood she and her therapist began to understand the repetitive scenario. She, she of course she connected sexual abuse with survival, and now her fear was of being found out to be not a child anymore. To be not deserved. Um, and the, the domino collapse was first the seizure, then the section or the, the A&E, and then possibly a bed on the ward. Um, so at this point, this is a kind of midpoint in the psychotherapy journey, a therapist needs to survive. Because if meaning and connection with the past could be found, it might just mean that time had not stood still and that psychological, psychic time had become alive and she could begin to live. So, I'm going to go on a bit because I think we're running a bit late. Patients such as Ella hold a mirror of failure to our service narratives. And the original diagnosis of epilepsy was the original marker of professional betrayal. Her seizures, evolved at moments of isolation and psychic foreclosure, were no, now markers of her own past and present dissociative attempts to destroy herself as witness. But in the course of therapy, she began, I think at the moment when she came back actually, the moment she, when she came back saying, look what you've done to me, you've devastated me, she began to possess her own vitality. I think this was a turning point. She was able to face terror and then the paralysis as well. And she allowed us to witness those times when her body remembered, while her psychic survival depended upon her capacity to forget. When she left the clinic, she wrote a card to her therapist. And in the card she wrote, I can now look up at the sky. It was by then three years since her last seizure. For at least that amount of time, she had not retreated into that abject robotic surrender protesting her own powerlessness, trying to convince other people of, a, of the realness of her suffering. So, relevant issues from this case. I chose this clinical fragment as it involves countless narratives of sexual abuse, and they're not all about rape, but here are some of the narratives of sexual trauma, which we will all be familiar with and which extend into uh, into the kind of discussions I, I imagine we'll be having. An enraged, there's an enraged and helpless victim. There's a sadistic perpetrator, an idealized rescuer. There's an uninvolved bystander, and there's a, ne a neglected child. And between these, Anna had been caught up in endless replay. Over time, some psychic change becomes possible as terror was able to give way to uncertainty. Instead of feeling terrified and frozen, she could begin to doubt, question. And within the therapeutic relationship, many of her initial perceptions were reshaped 
as she began to imagine an alternative world. And a new story began to unfold. And this is the story that has never been told as she begins to be able to exist, to imagine, to dream, to begin to transcend the mesmerizing or the mesmeric qualities of horror. So, looking ahead, thanks. Yeah. I haven't talked about the ICD-11 category, I, I'm assuming many of you will know it, but um, it, it can be looked up. But we need to use this category, which actually at first was coined by Judith Herman, who we first met when we designed our service. It's complex post-traumatic stress disorder. We, we need to be able to use this to inform service delivery. The complexities of individuals' individual survival strategies need detailed tracing. And we should maintain suspicion towards narratives of recovery or so-called returns to health. Now, following Judith Herman nearly 20 years ago, phases of recovery are accepted as part of the complex post-traumatic paradigm. And none of us can ever know at the beginning at what stage in her recovery journey a woman will enter a service. Four, it takes a village. As learning takes shape through our failures to bear witness to another's pain, we need support and supervision. And we need secure holding within our organization's structures. Five, no one, no one size fits all. Um, lastly and most important, we must ask women what, have, what has helped. Uh, have I moved? Is, that, is the next one? No, you go back, sorry. Right. I, I realize I've already told you about the mind thing. I'll pick it up again. I mentioned earlier how in, in the early days we lost, the, or MIND lost their budget to facilitate, to offer a facilitated moving on group for patients discharged from our service, and how some women within our service refused to have this happen and continue to meet independently. And that they still, they are still meeting, and they are still open to accepting new members, women discharged from, from the woman's service. I went to meet with them recently uh, for the first time. Um, they are interested in the film we are making about our service. They are interested to contribute. Um, that's been coordinated by Jantia Taylor, who's here today. Um, they spoke to me of being experts, of feeling themselves to be experts. A known writer has become interested in their story. Most of them have contributed to the PhD research of Rhea, and they want to know when they can read it, Rhea. They want to know when are we going to read about us, about the research. They each spoke of the meaning of experiencing each other grow and change over the years. And they still retain some of their original boundary structures. For example, they still initiate review they, um, they, they take a period, maybe a year, and they then review how they have progressed and moved on. They do that now, just as then, when Jane Unjumuth, their original facilitator, first began to encourage them. In answer to my question, what had been most important, they summed it up, that it was the feeling of being real within a diverse group. They're all very different. One united by the common experience of childhood sexual abuse. Last, last sentence. In this final stage of recovery, a new shared story is evolving in a protected space, which mirrors, mirrors aspects of the structure and the security of the woman's service, to which they all belonged, they all passed through, and where women now join other women who know something of the journey, the language, and the terrain each have tra traveled. They said they may still sometimes refer directly or obliquely to the language of their psychotherapy journey. They may still re-engage with the old shame and terror. Triggers to traumatic memory may still persist, but the past does not continue to structure their lives nor their identity. None has returned to mental health services. 
These are women who can realize at critical times that the isolation and shaming of each is dependent for its resolution on the empathy and the understanding of each. And severe and enduring has not remained their final account.